Now and again, a work of fiction will take you on a ride colored by laughter, intrigue, or fear, and truly connect with you in that moment. And then there are the experiences that mark themselves upon you and stay with you forever. Song of Horror, a third-person survival horror game developed by Spanish developers Protocol Games, is described on their website as a Lovecraftian-inspired story, looking to bring back the dread of old-school horror classics, while enhancing the experience with modern mechanics. Safe to say that they have certainly hit the mark, as the experience they have crafted goes far beyond just an homage to classic literature and gameplay mechanics, to being one of the most profoundly intense and deeply unnerving experiences I have ever had with horror media. The story centers around Daniel Neuer, a recovering alcoholic who, after picking himself up out of the charred embers of existence following life-threatening addiction, is working a steady job at a publishing firm when he's asked to check in on an author, Sebastian Husher, who has not responded to the firm about publishing his new book. During the game's prelude, Daniel visits the author's home to find it seemingly empty, an eerie tune playing out could be heard all around, and after some investigating is found to be emanating from a door, decrepit but reinforced the music bleeding through its cracks. Daniel, finding its key, steps through the door to find a music box, and the start of a journey that will take him and a number of others to the edge of their sanity. What is the song that plays from the music box, and why does the sound chill him to the bone? The story in Song of Horror is but only one of its rather strong elements that make up its dark adventure, a story I will be covering in full later on in the video, with a spoiler warning for those that want to experience it for themselves. Song of Horror is broken down into five major chapters, where you will play as Daniel as well as others close to him, such as his ex-wife and a close friend, with additional playable characters coming in the form of those linked with each environment, such as a shop owner's daughter and a curious police officer. Each character is voiced well, with each having a unique attribute to mix things up. Oh crikey, seriously? Why is it that all movies and video games seem to think that us British talk like that, with the crikey and the good gracious and all that? It's chuffing poppycock, I say. Gameplay centers around exploring the environment, solving puzzles, and reacting to the appearance of the presence in minigames to stay alive, which, as it's stated, sounds quite typical and bland. However, Song of Horror's execution is what makes this such a harrowing and memorable experience. The sound design is masterful, its droning soundtrack instilling hopelessness, coupled with sometimes very subtle environmental effects to keep the mind wandering. What was that? Hearing a door slam or footsteps piercing through the game's sometimes deafening silence. A mechanic that plays directly into this is the doors within the game, which can be frequently checked to listen to what is on the other side, as, and this is the kicker, the appearance of the presence both while exploring, as well as here, potentially behind this very door, has both scripted and procedurally generated events. So if you get caught out and are killed by the presence, your character is dead and not coming back meaning that even after getting to grips with your surroundings, you're never truly safe from what lurks in the darkness. Opening a door where the presence inhabits, or failing to hide, leads to instant, permanent death, which takes the stakes as well as the fear to extreme levels, but also does something else to its players. It programs the player to be hyper-alert to sounds within the game's levels, and then with this knowledge, the game then torments the player with ever more unnerving and shocking events and audio flourishes. Ah! Oh, the brother Jesus! I have to hide! Quick reminder, this man is a policeman. One thing each player character shares is that they are very much defenseless in the sights of the game's malevolence. Typical every men and women 
left with nothing but their wits and resolve to make their way through this nightmare. As previously mentioned, if during the game your character is killed, then there's no coming back for them, unless all characters in the chapter are killed, where which the player will need to restart from the beginning of that chapter. Being fully vulnerable alongside the game's permanent death system leads to two very polarizing effects. It can be frustrating to lose a character when the world is so dense with dangers in the darkness, and having to restart a chapter after losing them all can lead to sometimes losing up to an hour or two of progress. But what that does do is really give teeth to the figures and horrors you encounter, creating an environment where danger is real, and that demonic sound emanating from the hallway comes with it the potential for death, and with it a real price to pay. A fear that cannot be emulated in games when there is very little at stake. <laughs> okay mate, you're really not doing anything for British stereotypes right now. Please instead resume your screaming like Mickey Mouse. Oh. Thank you. A design decision that is ingrained in its desire to call back to horror titles of the past is the fixed camera angle, another divisive topic. Yes, this can lead to issues with the controls once the camera position shifts, and now and again face planting into the environment. But again, Song of Horror does not simply install this feature alone, but provides a full complement to it. The game features some of the most well-placed and horrifyingly subtle scares of any title I've played. Again, the player is conditioned to not always expect cinematic moments due to its constant fixed camera, in place of only having it where these moments are exclusively provided, like in most other free camera third-person offerings. Wandering the same halls time and time again solving puzzles, just enough to get familiar and let your guard down, and then... No jump scare sound, not a smash cut camera, these various small additions to the game land hard, again just adding to the sense that as the player, you are never safe. Something is always nearby, watching. So many small additions that so frequently caught me completely off guard, feeling like if I had blinked I would have missed it, but also in those few moments instilling such a powerful feeling of unease, as if I myself were falling into insanity along with the game's protagonists. Daniel. I find this style of keeping the player under duress so much more impactful than a simple jump scare. One moment of shock does not compare to the hours of dread felt while exploring Song of Horror's environments. I just saw something weird as fuck. Hey, clearly a fan of the channel. And while we're on the subject, please consider dropping a like and a comment on the video if you enjoy it, as it really helps the channel. Along with the game's visuals and struggles with the presence is of course the puzzles, which in the game range from the quite pedestrian and easy to put together, combining items found in the game to light a well or start a generator, to almost excessively cryptic, such as one centered around a picture found in a mental hospital, where even the developers have addressed its complexity with players directly, due to so many encountering difficulty solving it. I do feel that overall some of the game's solutions do range on the side of being slightly too convoluted and without a guide on hand can lead to a lot of time spent trying to figure out what the developers were alluding to. But as far as I'm concerned, having a challenge presented by complex puzzles outweighs the scenario where everything is a breeze and easily solvable within moments, especially when the puzzles themselves are so well woven into the game's locations and story. A reason for this is a fair amount of the game's puzzles will require uncovering some of the game's lore, and revealing with it more of its chilling story around the game, and the mystery around the presence not to mention the satisfaction of figuring out a tricky solution using nothing but your own deduction. I need to think this through. If I press the wrong lever... I have to admit I'm very impressed with this man's ability to press levers. The game's environmental design goes a long way to complement the horror experience. Alongside the previously mentioned subtle scares and opportunities to fill in the gaps yourself with the audio design, the chapters feature some highly varied yet all dread-inducing locations mainstays such as the classic dimly lit mansions and mental hospitals, to less utilized locations such as an antique shop and a university, all decked out with some great looking detail, fantastic lighting, and a huge amount of notes, books, and reports to keep you deeply engrossed in the unfolding narrative, learning more and more as the journey goes on. It's a real art to have so many alternative locations, but still keeping such a powerful atmosphere throughout the game, always feeling on edge, and that the dark corners could house something obscene and deadly, just waiting for the chance to strike. Cutscenes are played out both in engine, as well as with a graphic novel style when telling the game's story, working well to set the tone, but with the former pointing out some of the game's rougher edges, with some of the animations looking like they're straight out of Team America. Other times where I ran into issues were at one point Daniel getting so freaked out that he resorts to answering the emergency ceiling telephone, 
and to their credit the only soft lock in the run occurring during the interlude section. Only I could get soft locked in a toilet. And in all honesty these moments were very infrequent and even experiencing them wouldn't resonate for long as the atmosphere of the game was so powerful it would quickly pull me back into its darkness to battle through the story. A story I will be going into detail with now, so please if you wish to experience the game yourselves, the timestamp on screen will take you past the spoiler section, and please do skip ahead if you are thinking of playing the game, as with so many games of this type, the experience is made by the story and how it's told. We left off with the door found in the property of Sebastian Husher, swinging closed after Daniel searching the home, following Sebastian going missing. Not hearing from Daniel for days, Sophie van den End, Daniel's ex-wife, wonders if Etienne Bertrand, the manager at the publishing firm that sent Daniel to Husher's home, has heard from him. Etienne, shocked, also recounts that he's not heard from him since, and despite objections, Sophie obtains the address and goes in search of her ex-husband. Sophie exploring the property finds notes and letters left by the family's housekeepers, a family also nowhere to be found. Marsha, the mother of the housekeeper's family, recounts in a letter to her husband, who was away on a trip, and gives an insight into what may have happened to them all. I haven't seen Miss Catherine or the children in days. Sometimes I hear them crying upstairs, but I never find them. They always seem to be in the room next door, even if such room doesn't exist. There is something horrendous here with us. Something I can't describe. I barely dare to leave the room anymore. Riddled with questions, Sophie continues to explore the mansion, and with it begins to encounter the horrors within. The presence in the house, stalking her every move. Frantically, she uncovers the clues left by the family and unlocks the decrepit door in the study. Finding Daniel just in time to pull him out of the true darkness that lies within. Daniel awakens in a hospital surrounded by Sophie, Etienne and his close friend Lydia. His memory of the time trapped in the house is hazy, but he remembers the music box, its grim song playing out, hammering into his brain, but no sign of Sebastian Husher. Daniel's friends along with saving his life, provide him with the documents he and they discovered in Husher's home. Reading through them, Daniel notices that Husher sent the music box to a friend, Isaac Farber, owner of Farber & Sons Antique Store, which he runs with his daughter Erica Farber. The four discuss the experiences of Husher's mansion, and the decision is made to pay a visit to Farber's shop to uncover the truth behind Husher's disappearance, as well as the accursed music box. The antique shop is closed, but with Isaac not having a real grasp on security concerns, the key is found nearby, underneath a flower pot. Throughout the search of the store and the surrounding area, various letters between Husher and Farber are found, detailing their experience with the box and the horrors that began to befall them. To the black figure, those who crawl do not want to see it. They crawl, and the noise they make. No, don't ask. Don't get near. One note also contains the last location of the box, to be a bloodied wardrobe stored with a specific lot of antiques. With the presence ever stalking, the box is tracked down, after which they break into the office of Isaac Farber, only to be greeted with the grim sight of him hanging from the rafters. The darkness he faced grew too great for him to bear. After calling the police to handle Farber, the decision is made to return the box to its now known owner, Ariadne Legrand, in an attempt to end all the madness. Arriving at the address, they knock on the door and meet Ariadne, who upon receiving the box quickly asks, have you listened to it? Um, yes. He has listened to it. Daniel requests to stay with Sophie for a few days to let things settle down, but is quickly shown that the nightmare is far from over. Sebastian Husher is still missing, and Daniel is no closer to ridding himself of the hellish hallucinations he is experiencing. The university where Husher worked may contain some answers in the documents belonging to Husher, who is researching the origin of the box. Making his way there, Daniel runs into Grace and Omar, a student of Husher's and another one of the establishment's professors, who agree to help track down Husher's research on the box's origins. The three begin searching the archives for clues and are once again haunted by the presence throughout, but with their endeavors finally bearing fruit as they come across some of Husher's research, a newspaper article, 
detailing how the Legrand family years ago suffered a violent robbery, with baby Ariadne being the only survivor. After yet another encounter with the presence, oh. They find out that Husher also had a spot in the Institute's Grand Library, where he stored some of his research, and despite the dark entities infested within, come across this location to find a book, Natura Tenebrosa, Sinister Nature, written by Edgar O'Dell and William Lasque, that details all the investigation carried out by Argon Le Grant, and with it surely the whereabouts of Sebastian Husher, St. Cecilia's Abbey. Saint Cecilia being the patron saint of music, and the location being one that once hosted a cursed concert that no one escaped alive, and where Husher has gone in search of answers. We join Husher in his search of the abbey, which is cut short by the relentless attacks from the presence, but not before Husher finds a method from the abbey monks to tell how much longer one curse from the box has got before their death, using light to manipulate the darkness. This shall remain as written testimony of everything that has been discovered, and that has been passed on to me, as it may prove valuable to whomsoever finds it. Sitting in front of the mirror, they observe their own reflection, and everything behind them. When they proceed to put the lamp out or dim its flame to the point that the eyes, blinded by the previous glow, no longer see, thereupon they light it once more and again observe their own reflections, and everything behind them, repeating the process several times, and sometimes, God help us. The reflection shown in the mirror isn't what it should be. I can't begin to describe the horrors that appear. But what I can say is that the more frequently these horrors appear, the closer they are. And the less time we have them. Until... Until they are no longer only in the reflection. Daniel pulls up to the abbey and is greeted by Ernest Finnegan, a close friend of Husher who Husher had tasked with getting him to the abbey, only to disappear for four days. This was nothing new to Ernest, who thought nothing of it. But after Daniel reveals his dark tale thus far, Ernest agrees to escort him to the abbey and search for his dear friend. The abbey is in disrepair, making exploration challenging. Coupled with that, the presence is aware of their efforts, continuing to stalk them. What they uncover is what happened to the inhabitants of St. Cecilia's Abbey. A tragic tale to say the least, many driven to insanity and paranoia, leading to many deaths and disappearances. In a desperate effort, those that lived began worshipping the patron saint of music. Amongst so much pain and destruction, everything stopped, following the events of the last concert of 1912. And with the silence, the abbey and its inhabitants were forgotten. The group delve deeper and uncover a door with four keys and set about unlocking the clear location of Sebastian Husher with Daniel eventually volunteering once again to enter the darkness. Husher has to be in here. It's time to put an end to this nightmare. Husher is found, but it is too late. However, Daniel is still past the door, deep into the dark, and cannot find his way back and while trying to do so, finds a room seemingly inhabited by a young Ariadne Legrand and a female doctor. On the desk lies the diary of Argos Legrand, the music box's original owner. Argos, obsessed with the supernatural, had also researched into the tragic events at the Abbey, along with the song that was played. Argos was also the one to gift the box to his daughter, Ariadne. Daniel grabs it before leaving, and to his relief, finding himself back where he entered the door. something. There must be something here. Returning home for some much needed rest, 
Daniel wakes and begins reading through the diary for any leads on how to end his nightmare, but instead stumbles across yet another one. It transpires that the violent robbery that struck House Legrand years ago was actually Argos Legrand himself, unknowingly murdering his entire family. The presence infecting his mind, causing him to hallucinate and believe that in place of his family were agents of the darkness, there instead to take the lives of his family themselves. After realizing what he had done, Argos could not bear the grief, taking his own life to escape it. A note can be found at the end of the diary from one Berenice Prestegard, a therapist working at Jeremy Hartwood Mental Hospital. Daniel realizes that she must have been the one assigned to young Ariadne to assess her mental state after the tragedy with her family, and plans are made to go to the hospital to continue the search, but Daniel cannot do this alone as he still plans to visit Ariadne once more, so enlists the help of his friend Lydia to investigate the hospital. While searching and fighting off the presence, Lydia uncovers a number of notes, recordings, and files detailing Berenice's findings with Ariadne, as well as the hospital's own investigations into the effects of the music box. Disturbing findings reveal that Ariadne was closed off to most people, and worryingly, somehow knew what she would look like in the future, as well as knowing of her eventual meeting with Daniel. Searching further details that at the request of Ariadne, Berenice goes to the former home of the Legrand's family. The entities now inhabiting the house creep into her nightmares, taking her through a range of dark and disturbing scenes. However, on the third night, Berenice, during one of these nightmares, figures out how to end all the dark events emanating from the box by returning it to its owner, the presence. After this is found by Lydia, she quickly informs Daniel, who has made his way to Ariadne's home. He asks her where the box is, which she informs him is upstairs. Employing the technique learned from Husha, Daniel transports himself to the lair of the presence. Where am I? After completing two chilling trials, he finally makes it to the home of the music box. God. This place. There. Where he quickly deposits it, before being chased out by a wave of writhing darkness, closing the door and bringing him back to reality. Back in the home of Ariadne, he informs her that the song will never play again, before passing out on the sofa. When he wakes, it's to pitch black. Ariadne can be seen staring out of the window, and when Daniel asks to turn on the light, she informs him. No. He doesn't like the light. Placing another music box before him, revealing the two boxes were made. One for each child. With that, Song of Horror concludes, ending as bleak and as mysterious a way as it started. And I've won appreciate that it steers away from the happily ever after to really drive home the horror for its conclusion. Leaving so much mystery in the plot threads does really well to keep things interesting and there's a lot of more deeper lore and smaller plot points hidden throughout the game. Although following many typical trends in horror, both the voice talent and the quality of the writing in the notes and literature found in the game brings it together really nicely and complements the game's dark stylings. Song of Horror set out to revive an experience that was thought to die out in the early 2000s, along with the playstyles of pioneers such as Resident Evil and Silent Hill bringing back a focus around the atmosphere created by the game as a whole, as opposed to relying on contemporary special effects and set pieces to do most of the heavy lifting. This game has a mood to it. The insanely well-placed soundtrack and the small horrifying touches to each chapter wrapped up in the procedurally generated antagonist, for me, left me with an experience that I will never forget. You may call me sick, but getting such a profound sense of dread from a piece of interactive media is exactly what I look for when diving into the horror genre. The sheer attention to detail pulling the player's focus around and tormenting them throughout its runtime is just outstanding in this title. The permadeath and sometimes highly cryptic puzzles I'm sure won't be to everybody's taste, but for those that maybe look back on the late 90s, early 2000s survival horror greats fondly, wishing for a contemporary revival, ladies and gentlemen, it lives once again. And for those willing to step into its world, are in for one hell of a ride. Thank you so much for watching. This was a bit of an expansion of what we typically cover on the channel, but this game's a crazy time and I felt it worth sharing with you guys. 
Of course, the regular RPG greatness will be returning up next in full force, but I'm really keen to get your guys' opinion on this video. Both returning viewers and anyone new to the channel, please drop the video a like if you enjoyed it, and consider subscribing to the channel for all sorts of RPG content. Thanks again for anyone making it this far into the vid, and I'll see you guys in the next video.